for those that aren't familiar, though I think you all are, I'm Larry Pross from SRM, and uh, I'm the host of Tech Talks, and that's where we discuss the intersection of traditional finance and emerging fintech. Uh, I, I was mentioning earlier, for some of the word on the call, I, I'm doing about the most fintech-y thing you can do. I'm taking the call from my parents' base, <laughs> basement. My uh, my daughter's graduating high school tomorrow, and so the family's together. I'm out at my, my parents' farm, and uh, the, the quietest place was in the basement, so very, very fintech-y. Well, today we're going to be talking uh, artificial intelligence and really excited. We've got uh, the CEO from Position AI, Robbie. I, Robbie, I'll let you introduce, you kind of give a little bit of background of yourself. And then Zaire Zier, Z, uh, the COO of Position AI. And, uh, and before I turn it over to you guys, I, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got started. But you know, we're really seeing a... Uh, a, re, a reemergence of large M and A activity, and you guys are going to talk about that today. But I was, I was, I, I'd seen a bunch of stuff in the news, and so I, I, I did, I did a little bit of Google searching, and like even in the FI sector, I think I counted five in the last week announcements. So we had, um, obviously today, the big one was, you know, this is kind of FI related. I think it is. It's Robinhood is acquiring the cryptocurrency exchange Bitstamp for. $200 million. We had uh, ELGA credit union. So that's a Michigan based credit union that announced they're acquiring Marine Bank and Trust in Florida. And that's a $79 million deal. We've got National Bank of Blacksburg, Blackburg acquiring Frontier Communication Bank in Virginia. That's a $16 million deal. Academy Bank to buy um, Mountain View Bank of Commerce. That's out of Colorado. In Bank of New Glarus, I think, acquires First National Bank in Darlington, and that's in Wisconsin. And then obviously earlier this year, we had the, the Capital One's acquisition of a, that's a $35 billion deal of Discover Card. So, I mean, that, that probably just sets the table in terms of the conversation today. Uh, you guys obviously do um, kind of M&A and investment, using AI for M&A and investment. Uh, obviously, the folks on the call are financial service related, but but this is applicable to a large uh, number of kind of verticals. So with that, I'll I'll turn it to, over to uh, Robbie and uh, Z. If you guys want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your background, how you got into this, your uh, your 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 love of AI and and everything in the M and A space, and uh, you guys have a a presentation to share. So we'll. Um, We'll let people ask some questions at the end as well. And, and then, then while, when we get started here, for those of you that aren't speaking, I think you guys are comfortable if any time anyone wants to interrupt and ask a question. But yeah. for those that aren't, just uh, put yourselves on mute if you don't mind. And with that, uh, we'll turn it over to you guys. All right. Well, thanks. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Larry, for having us. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I just want to first start with the... Um, you know, uh, the company name is called Positon. It's a play on oh, word from uh, Positano. It comes Sorry about Positano. that. I, I, for some reason, I keep reading that as a position, but Positano, no, no, no. okay. You know, we've heard that like a million times. You know that. <laughs> like it happens. But the good thing is that you do it once and then that's it. Like there you go. I've memorable. So, but it comes from, uh, you know, um, there's different, uh, it's a play on word for, on different things. One of them, being Positano and Malfi Coast, absolutely gorgeous place. And uh, the inspiration is that it's so serene, beautiful that, you know, folks in the M&A uh, due diligence and and doing that kind of work that they appreciate a little bit of levity, right? Um, kind of, um, you know, uh, you know, they can appreciate something like that. So, um, but what you're looking at here is the agenda for today. So basically we'll do a quick intro. And then we'll go into an M&A trends in 2024 and beyond. And we'll talk about the AI impact and implementation um, for, for the enterprise and folks that want to get into that. And then we'll talk about how Positon AI comes in and its impact on the M&A process. What is the current state of the M&A process? What is the future state? And we transition from there to open discussion. But to what uh, Larry also said, feel free to jump in. Uh, with questions midstream, so we don't want to make we don't want to just talk at you, but we'd love for this to be a conversation. We'll impart some of the knowledge that we have, but you know we'll, we can go from there. All right, so um, the little bit about the founders. I'm Robbie Zari. 
uh, co-founder and CEO of Positon AI. I started my career in software engineering with uh, a bachelor's and master's in uh, embedded systems engineering. This is microprocessor programming and things like that. Um, and I transitioned to the business side, you know, they, you know what I call the dark side uh, of, 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 of uh, uh, basically the dark side. And uh, I went, but I did stay in the tech industry. So I was uh, in corporate development. Uh, I was an executive in corporate development at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. I did. Uh, I worked on two billion plus dollars of acquisitions. One of them was um, Cray Supercomputing, uh, being the largest at 1.4 billion. And uh, I am based here in the Bay Area. I live in Napa, but uh, I was originally born in uh, Casablanca, Morocco. I'll pass it on to Z. Hey there, folks. Just a quick double check. You y'all can hear me okay? Um, <clears throat> my name is Zahir Ali. Uh, my background's a little uh, different, but similar. Uh, I'm a technologist by training. Um, my uh, education was in experimental physics um, and uh, what happened over the years is i realized that uh, uh, i was a pretty good physicist pretty good engineer but um i was also pretty good at uh, kind of getting things done so continued to veer into uh executive management executive functions and all that um my my love affair with ai began at the tender age of 17 and a half um, my first internship at livermore when um, uh, they they said, hey, um, you've taken a couple of computer science courses as a freshman in college, go figure this out. Um, and we started implementing ways of, uh, of, of optimizing the way laser wavefronts um, uh, interacted. But, uh, you know, you, you kind of uh, go from, for, from those types of uh, things uh, moving forward um, to a lot of different applications of AI, um, decision support, um, uh, leveraging it uh, in in all kind of uh, verticals, uh, both technical and then also in in operations uh, and business. Um, did a lot of that um, at NASA, where um, I was, um, and and at the kind of enterprise companies, uh, the you know the usual um, uh, defense uh, contractor suspects, Lockheed, uh, Northrop, etc., where we were implementing AI both in the products we were developing, but also in adopting it internally to support uh, our work as a business, um, everything from parts management and supply chain to integrating it into our ERPs. Um, and, and of course, you know, uh, moving on the journey of a business executive, that, that became important. Along the way, uh, also can uh, with DVC expert. Um, so got a lot of exposure. Um, one of the deals uh, that, that was fun that, uh, that I worked on just a couple of years ago um, was uh, the the fire sale of Virgin Orbit after after it had um, uh, well gone belly up um, uh, in 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 a rather spectacular fashion, <laughs> uh, and so that was that was very interesting. Uh, and and I'm based out here in the San Francisco Bay Area as well. Uh, I'm a born and raised uh, San Francisco, California boy. So um, you know you might find me um, in front of the laptop, or you might find me you know with board shorts on running out to, into the surf. Uh, depending depending on the day and, and the time of day. Love it. So, um, jumping right in, um, you know, M and A have been an interesting beast um, in the last few years. We've experienced a lot of um, uh, ups and downs in interesting times, but you know, after a slowdown in twenty three. Uh, you you kind of scan uh, the experts, um, the analysts, uh, the different reports and intelligence. Uh, what we've seen is that we've seen um, it, it was predicted and, and we've seen it play out uh, a rise in M&A activity in, in 24, um, primarily due to uh, some stabilization of the economic outlook, um, but also um, due to healthy consumer spending. Um, what's interesting, though, is that looking forward, kind of uh, second half of 24 and, and, and onward, you're seeing companies look much more for strategic acquisitions. They want to expand their market presence, you know, look for tech and talent. Um, of course, just, you know, in general, stay competitive or ahead. Um, but they're doing it in, in a little more interesting way. Whereas uh, in the first half, we've seen a lot more of the larger deals. Um, moving forward, you're seeing 
um, pe people be more strategic, looking for smaller companies and players, ones that bring niche capabilities uh, or expertise that really complement their own offerings. Um, and when you think about how that's being structured, um, what you re see is not it's not it's not across all sectors. Um, there are clearly some sectors that are hot. Uh, the pink, you know, the the 300, you know, sorry, the 500 pound gorilla in the room, of course, is is AI, um, which remains uh, very hot. But other industries like healthcare, um, heavy industry, um, and and actually defense tech um, are are pretty hot. And and you're seeing other industries that are kind of uh, adjacent to that, like um, uh, EVs and and supply chain resilience, often leveraging a lot of these modern technologies, also um, be be interesting areas where where we're seeing uh, M and A and and a, a lot of A more than I think M <laughs> on on this one, uh, more acquisitions than mergers. But what is also emerging is that you can't do this in the same way you did it for the last n number of years. Um, everything's moving faster. Um, there's there, there there's a need for speed. There's a need for efficiency and better performance overall. Um, and you look at reports like the Gartner report, like some of these papers by Gartner. Um, they're they're talking about like uh, really implementing AI sharply within this process. Um, and what's interesting is that it's all across the value chain, and we're, we're going to touch upon that again. Rob's got a, a couple of specific, uh, interesting slides he's going to go over. Um, but fundamentally, what what the what the what Gardner and the others are recommending is that folks apply AI within the internal M&A process. There's a lot of this AI that's external AI that's kind of adjacent, but it's not in the core processes. It's not in the core business functions. That's actually where they're saying that it has the both sharp um uh quick roi and also a lot of um, long-term uh possibilities uh so you know i when you think about that discussion it's interesting um we're seeing m a you know come back but it's being done differently um it's there are sectors that are hot there are sectors that are not hot um and overall, the community is, is, is looking at how they can implement technology to really make this not just a faster and a more efficient process, but one with better outcomes uh, and, and results. Uh, you know, and, and they're looking at applications every, you know, across the board from, you know, due diligence to agreements uh, and negotiation uh, to all the way through to um, uh, integration. And it really, you know, uh, that's why I, I want to point to this quote from uh, Carmine uh, Di Sabio. Uh, Di Sabio, um, and, uh, and 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 uh, the landscape that says that the landscape is experiencing more shifts and trends that that will really force companies to rethink how they do these transactions. Um, and I love that he says, you know. Big and small opportunities are waiting to be seized by those who dare to innovate and adapt. And that's really what we're talking about here today is if you've got the guts to innovate and adapt, let's think about how you do it, where you do it, and how we can really capture the value from that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so when you think about this, there's a lot Right. People said, you know, I think it was McKinsey said that 23 was the year that the world really got to know AI. 24 is the year that it's going to make its impact. Well, OK, how is that working? Where, where is that happening? It's really happening across all industries. Um, and fundamentally, you know, we chose some key examples here. Um, one of them is, is the legal document analysis, where law firms are increasingly using AI um, and AI-powered platforms to analyze legal contracts. Um, and these platforms can do things like identify potential risks, inconsistencies, um, and clauses that are requiring negotiation, which saves people a lot of time and money. But you also don't want to be that like that guy who got disbarred because he took he had you know GPT create a uh, some sort of briefing, um, submitted it to a judge, who then realized that that more than half of the references were complete fabrications. So, so you know, we're also going to jump into you got to know how to use AI, um, or you got to work with the right experts. 
Um, this is a tool that is both tremendously powerful, but if misapplied or misused, can 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 be really disastrous. Um, another great use case um, is in the medical side, and this is something that a lot of us um, AI practitioners have been hoping for really for a couple of decades, um, all the way back to like IBM Watson and even before that, where we understood that the AI is going to eventually be able to spot things that humans have varying probabilities of catching. Um, and so you've seen th that in, in medical screenings, prime, uh, um, lung cancer, um, uh, uh, these types of uh, um, different types of uh, um, computer tomography, um, where you're looking at, at brain, um, the AI is beating repeatedly with high, high confidence levels and very few uh, false positives or false negatives, um, the diagnoses of uh, very highly trained doctors to the point where this is now becoming a decision support system for doctors, the same way that we have uh, decision support systems for, for uh, fee, um, uh, field commanders in the military that help them recognize enemies and threats, that's now being applied to, to the medical field. So this is a really great success story that's gonna help uh, really, really change people's lives, live, help them sa help save lives and, and make the world better. Um, do you also have uh, other, other very concerning stories like uh, the one with Zillow, um, which is AI-based investing, where, where they learned the hard way, don't pull the human out of the loop. <laughs> yep, another one is modeling proteins. Um, and, and, and it's interesting because just down the road from, from Robbie and I, you have uh, Slack, Stanford Linear Accelerator Lab, where they've built um, what's called an attosecond laser. That's one times 10 to the negative 16th of a second. So extreme, extreme time precision. And what they're doing is they're actually, they're actually pulsing the laser like a strobe light behind unfolding proteins. Um, to characterize how they, um, they they work in the reactions, and they feed that into um, uh, different. They use that as data for machine learning systems to then predict how tweaking the protein in different ways with drugs or or or, or, or different types of genetic modifications, etc., is going to change the way that it acts in biological systems. So it's really spectacular stuff. But just to jump back <clears throat> to, to the Zillow, right? You pull the human out of the loop, you can cause a problem. What Zillow did, the Phoenix housing bubble was primarily caused by Zillow, uh, somebody at Zillow making the call to let the AI start bidding on properties directly without human approval. And it created a feedback loop uh, that, that created a bubble. I actually know several people because uh, my 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 thunder my my uh, grad school Thunderbird um, was out of Phoenix, the Phoenix area, right? So I have a lot of friends I know who are like, "Oh, we're selling our house, dude. This is totally inflated. We don't understand why." And of course, we found out later, um, Zillow had to had to write off a bunch. They've got a lot of property that they're underwater on, on now because what they were doing is they were making a play to um, to to uh, corner the market on things. What they realized is they created the bubble that they then cornered themselves into and and had problems getting out of. So you have to be really careful. When you say AI is going to do decision support, but it's decision support, not necessarily decision making quite yet. Um, and then lastly, um, this is a oh, just before uh, you know, I I'm really I'm really excited about um, AI enabled digital twins because what this is doing is this is really helping uh, companies like GE where they they have basically a complete digital entity that represents um, these these amazing jet engines that they build and and it lets them run the engine in the simulation as if it's running real in real life to help them predict potential failures to optimize performance pr you know uh, mini you know minimizing downtimes do proactive maintenance overall lowers the cost of ownership uh, of that engine by by fa by multiple factors two to five is what they report so really tight use cases you can see clearly across the board uh, AI is a horizontal, um, and it's impacting every industry. Next, please. Yeah, I think um, you know. I think that's the important the important point there. I think is to understand that there's a lot of uh, uh, highly, um, you know, uh, complex 
use cases that AI is actually addressing today. Um, it, the approach and the framework um, for that is super important and understanding the buy versus build of AI is also important. So, um, so what we did is we prepared, what is the cost benefit, um, you know, implication here for different approaches of implementing AI? When people hear about that, they mostly know about gen AI, but there's different approaches that, um, that you have to consider. One is building and training uh, the model. So what, that, what does that mean exactly? So this approach is kind of a, an AI, these are AI models that can be created from scratch, trained, um, you need large data sets, large amount of data, um, and it, it's super costly uh, in terms of development, resource intensive. Um, I kind of uh, equate it to, you know, uh, basically, you know, raising a, you know, a child from, you know, from uh, kindergarten all the way to, you know, uh, graduating from, you know, from uh, from a university, right? So that the, we could think of all the implications there, the costs, the benefits, and what have you. But if you go to fine tuning, this is these are a, a different um, a different approach where you can take a pre trained model. This is somebody uh, out of college um, that you can train and make them specific. I guess the analogy I would give is it's kind of like um, um, you know, taking a, a robot that knows how to clean a house, you know, to also organize toys in the room, for example, right? Um, it doesn't need to learn everything from scratch. So it's quicker and more efficient to train them on, on uh, organizing um, uh, toys in the room. The cost for this is a lot less than, you know, training and, and um, uh, training a new model. Um, and uh, essentially, um, you can, it still requires some uh, iterations for tuning in terms of training, but it's not as intensive as, you know, training and building a new one from scratch. Um, you can also think of using something off the shelf, right? So imagine having a ready made robot that already knows how to do many th different things like cooking, cleaning, and you know, playing games and, you know, you can take, uh, you know, off the shelf model um, like, you know, this ready made robots and you can make them directly without spending time uh, building them from the ground up. Uh, you can uh, basically buy a toy robot that can ready can be ready to do fun stuff right out of the box. You know, as you can imagine, this is you know, uh, mostly uh, low cost, but still requires some updating of the models with new data sets and things like that. Uh, quick and easy, you know, in terms of the benefits uh, to deploy and adaptable to evolving data that you might have and changing environments. So the, that's that's the third bucket. The, th the fourth bucket is integrating your AI models with um, um, you know, existing capabilities that you have. So it's kind of adding superpowers to, you know, what you, the things that you already have, like in an example of, um, you know, you might have a toy car that can move on its own, but, you know, it can't talk, right? So by integrating AI model, um, now you gave it the ability to talk and respond to you and you can have that exchange and you just elevated, you know, that toy car. Uh, the cost for that is, you know, moderate to high investment initially, right? So you've set that up, hardware, software, integration, and now you have actual real processing, real-time processing, and improved performance, you know, with less resources. So the um, reason I mentioned this is, is like different approaches that you can actually think about AI. It's not all generative AI, and it's not all just building you know, AI from scratch. Um, and a lot of the enterprises, they might have to consider what is the cost benefit for us in terms of building this or or, uh, or buying it. And my favorite analogy actually is, is salesforce.com. So the way we look at it is the times when everybody needed a CRM for their Salesforce, a lot of companies were building it in-house 
But Salesforce came out and said, look, we're going to take best practices from the industry and we're going to build this and you focus on your core competency and we'll build this for you. So from our experience talking with our customers, investment banks, private equity, what have you, almost invariably everybody we talk to has a budget for exploring what AI can do internally. There's an uh, investment in tech, data, strategy, and um, the interesting thing, I think a lot of folks are going to come to that conclusion. How do we make sure that, um, you know, do we do we buy this or do we build it? And if we want to build it, you know, what are these approaches that one of these approaches that makes most sense for us? Um, so a little bit about um, kind of nice segue about who we are. So Positon was founded in, in 2022, January 22. Um, and our executive team uh, is, is highly experienced, very strong experience in investment banking, private equity, corporate development, and, and software engineering. So, um, you know, our platform, essentially what you're looking at is, you know, it digitizes the entire engagement across all the actors in the ecosystem. So we address and automate the complexity of the M&A workflow and data management in an intuitive, secure, and efficient uh, manner. So we essentially looked at every single actor, what are the um, key business needs and interests, and we ensure that our platform addresses th those, those needs directly. Excuse me. So meantime, as we're doing all this, we forged partnerships from a technical standpoint and also from a go-to-market with Microsoft, Salesforce, and NVIDIA. And um, well, also, we recently had a, a partnership with the Mercury banking system, which basically uh, connects the startup ecosystem to us. And we're exploring other partnerships as well with, uh, you know, different accelerators and different actors in the ecosystem. Um, uh, the, the other thing to keep in mind here is the, the security. Security for us is paramount and we built it from the core. We call it core to edge. So from a technical perspective, we built it and we went through all the security reviews to be partners with, you know, the Microsoft of the world, Salesforce and what have you to be able to actually go to market with them and sell to their own customers as well, um, which meant, uh, you know, going through their security review, but also we have the SOC 2 type 2 uh, audit and security compliance, um, you know, um, you know, which is basically the the highest security standard you can get in in um, in North America. Um, so what are we solving for, right? Um, we come, like I mentioned, the executive team and and a number of our uh, uh, leaders within the company come from investment banking, private equity, and corp dev. Um, it's it's surprising to see that, or or for some folks that are not in the industry, to see that there's about two billion two trillion dollar industry give or take dependent on the swings that z was talking about earlier the ups and downs it could be two trillion to four trillion depending on the year 70 to 90 percent of those transactions fail and if you look at the entire the entire process the m a process the current state you know you go from you know uh sourcing all the way to um you know information exchange to um, you know, LOI, post LOI to due diligence, deep dive due diligence, negotiations, closing and what have you. The entire process is, uh, you know, um, is is uh, filled with ad hoc tools. Um, there's processes that um, within that are ripe for or um, ripe for disruption, but they they're kind of uh, antiquated in a way that you have tools and you have processes that um, just not using the modern technology to the, of today to make the process faster. So, um, and, and the reason we talk about speed in this in this case is a lot of the deals fail before they close because of the speed of, uh, of the due diligence and the speed to, to close. So increasing that gives you a higher chance of closing. But even th when things fail, you'll have Everybody, different uh, stakeholders in different process in different areas of the process, pointing fingers at each other. So I can name a ton of examples that were litigated after the failure of the transaction, and you don't know where the actual problem happened. Is it integration? Is it 
during the due diligence, everybody points the finger at the other. So in this case, what we're trying to do is automate and make the process more transparent and more digitized so we can um, we can uh, basically focus on value creation as opposed to a lot of the mundane things that happen on a, on a day to day. So, um, so what is this uh, uh, programmatic MA that you hear you hear about a lot? So this is the future that we we see as McKinsey did about 12 year study that concluded that companies in, that engage in programmatic MA, you'll see on the left chart there how much efficiencies that they can have. It ranges from 40% to 100% efficiencies across revenues, cost synergies, and just across the board, uh, any way you look. And these are folks that you know, we're able to create a repeatable process and a repeatable uh, playbook, and um, they have the knowledge base in-house versus others that are always constantly going through a manual process of, of doing m and um, So modernizing the m and process is crucial, right, to, to overcoming some of these challenges in the current state that I showed you. Um, and technology is in the core. Uh, of, of what we're talking in this modernization, right? So we're talking about um, streamlining and enhancing the, all the stages in the process. Um, you know, and, and I do believe that, you know, folks that are still captive to fear, uncertainty, and doubt about automation and AI in this space will absolutely stay be left behind. I mean. Uh, We've seen this over and over. Um, AI is a new tool, new shiny tool, but it's anybody that actually adopts it and go, going forward, um, they will have a competitive advantage uh, compared to the, the ones that are still, um, you know, there's a proper way to do this, and we can dive into this, uh, into how that's done uh, in an in appropriate manner with SLAs uh, in place, service level agreement that guarantees security and compliance of the data, it guarantees um, the use cases that you use for AI are, you know, ring fenced for you and for the customers, so the data is not going anywhere. So um, with that, quick, yes. Quick, quick guys, just a, a comment. Um, I was involved at a credit card company called MBNA back in the day. Is one of the other colleagues on the call is, um, and we used to do a ton of merger acquisitions, bunch of different deals where we're going and buying credit card portfolios. And it was surprising how consistent the process we used was from acquisition to acquisition. And I can see many opportunities to kind of streamline that and automate that process. And, and what you're doing is obviously much broader than that. It's on both the buy and sell side, from my, my understanding. But uh, but it, it seems like it would be a really natural thing to not only streamline, but also eliminate some of the human errors that could creep up in that kind of a process. So uh, a yeah, really, really neat solution. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And that's exactly right. And, and it's the the way, you know, from our experience, and I, like I mentioned earlier, I did 2 billion plus of acquisitions and I've seen this play out in front of me. I couldn't even say good morning to folks on Instant Messenger without them, you know, uh, cringing and, you know, <laughs> and and uh, breaking into hives because they think I'm going to about to disclose them and uh, you know and start working on a new deal right because it's it's a grueling function uh, MA for m a practitioners um, and uh, it takes a lot of hours a lot of man uh, man hours and uh, the idea is that you know how do we actually alleviate a lot of that work how do we take and you can see a lot of the stuff that happens um, it's just mundane work that you know can easily be automated, and folks leave. And the reason I mentioned that it's it's a grueling function because it's high attrition. So most of these folks they they there's a high turn uh, turnover, and um, now you have to coach and transition and have success uh, you know success a succession plan, and uh, so that knowledge base goes away with these folks. And that muscle memory also it goes away with these folks. So it's tied to people as opposed to being systemic. Again, I go back to Salesforce. It's a very similar uh, uh, kind of concept with, with Salesforce.com. You moved from Excel and Rolodex from uh, sales reps. Now the companies actually own that knowledge base. 
they own the deal uh, deal flow, and they own the analytics and predictability of their uh, revenue. So um, we're doing something very similar for M&A practitioners, whether it's investment banks, private equity, or corp dev uh, teams and in, in, enterprise and mid-market. Uh, with that, I'd like to, um, you know, uh, uh, move to the capabilities. And uh, Z, if you want to speak to this and sure and give them a high Sure, happy to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so I mean, it, you know, we, we've talked about it. <clears throat> and Rob's gone into some detail already. But if you, if you imagine a tool, right, that's not just an intuitive platform, but also starts to empower people now with with the AI. That's really what Positon is. Um, when, when you you know when people think about it, they ask us, "So are you guys a data room?" I mean, that's that's a sliver of of, of the platform. Um, but you know, a sixteen year old can create a data room now with I think about fifteen lines of code. So those guys out there hawking data rooms um, are are gonna go the way of, of, of uh, the brontosaurus here I think uh, not too not too, too uh, far from now um, right it's it, it, what what the ecosystem needs and and, and what positive on is something far beyond that it's a comprehensive solution that really supports folks whatever stage they're in whatever side of the deal they're on um, and it, it provides things like that automated workflow that we're talking about. Uh, earlier, you you know, we're, we're using the power of AI not just to optimate, uh, so not just, sorry, not just to automate, but optimize um, by making tasks more efficient, but also supporting the analysis, um, the evaluation, the notification of, of, of other capabilities, taking uh, offline, ta uh, offline tasks online. And, and really, because you're out of, you know, the separate apps and all those different tools, right? you're now in an end-to-end -end system that understands how things are connected and helps create more connections for you. Um, it, it really enables you to do a lot more. Um, and, and to your earlier point, Larry, about the repeatable playbook, uh, you know, right? That's, uh, it, it, you know, what we've implemented, it makes it really easy to replicate that, right? You had the playbook, but you still had to execute it in, in a serial siloed fashion rather than saying, hey, that worked out really well. Let's let let's do exactly the same thing with automation, right? So that you don't have to recreate it. You don't have to a lot of the a lot of the non-value add stuff that goes on around that is, is something that's really what the computer should be doing uh, for you. Um, so you know we make it e easy to replicate um, and then create success by leveraging the institutional knowledge you have, the processes, all of that with a click of a button. The uh, it's not just for it's not just for convenience, but it's all, but it minimizes the deal risk as well and provides a lot of resiliency to, to the deal team. Were you trying to say something, Larry? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was just thinking something you said earlier that I think is pretty important, which is it, it eliminates some of that, the human element where if you lose a, a key individual in one of these yes. processes, you can, it can really set you back on a deal, right? And to, to yeah. not have that, human element you know both from a you know air standpoint but also like if you lose that resource it, it, it that's a that's a pretty big win i would think you know we think so and what it does is you know it, it's multifaceted right it, if you have somebody somebody you know somebody's in a car accident right it could be any reason right and look hey they got to deal with their life they're out um so it it, it, it helps smooth that over um but also you have attrition, you know, as Robbie pointed out, right? This is our high intensity set of functions in the business world. And, and people do burn out, people, people leave, they, or they move off to another part of the organization for rotation before they come back. So this helps you keep all that. But also on the front end, you're pulling new people in, it really shortens that learning curve because, the pro because a lot of what is the best practices are now in the platform, not just in people's heads, not just on their hard drives, or, or in their notebooks, um, you know, and then other features such as the global sourcing uh, and cap table management. This is now where we're talking about bringing both and en both ends of that pipe, right? The the sourcing part, we have the Positon network. Um, we have within that database, we have 150,000 of the hottest uh, companies in the world uh, curated. 
um, you know, by by industry, by, by stage, by by you know, demonstrated interest and milestones. Um, and we have a unique approach to incentivize those private companies to be on their platform with their data, keeping that data 100% in their control while still making them ready for investment and partnership and exit and enabling them to share that data when they want to in the right ways at the right time in a controlled fashion with, with folks. Uh, and, and then to support that kind of sell side, the SMB, we have amazing features like our AI powered cap table management. Um, it, it's a tool that enables them to literally drag and drop all of their investment documentation in, in, into the AI and immediately deliver a cap table that show that's fully calculated, shows all the dilution, uh, all the math is done. Um, taking that human error element out of it again and, and sorting out, because these things can be complex when you got layers on layers on layers, right? Um, and then lastly, but far from least, we're very excited um, about uh, our newest feature, what we call uh, the AI diligence auto response, ADAR. And what this does is it takes the data that's on the platform. Uh, it, it's a powerful assistant that mines that data um, to provide recommended answers to uh, diligence requests in real time. So whatever you're doing, it's your assistant, whether in that moment you needed to be an analyst or you needed to be um, somebody to, to understand uh, um, uh, different uh, parts of the business, what have you, it's there uh, and it, it understands how to look at the data cap and give you the, the important stuff. And it also understands the questions that are being asked. So, so again, that connectivity, that connective tissue within the data is a lot of what we've created here. And, and this is done um, with the highest security in a framework that's sitting on top of the SLAs that Robbie men mentioned earlier. So when people are using uh, different types of AI, they're, they're, they're leveraging models, a lot of, I, it concerns me very much with my background in deeply classified projects when I worked in the defense industry, because they don't know where that data is going. And I, I they like really don't know. Yeah. We know. Yeah, Z, I'd, so like, I'd like to add something here because um, I think, you know, we mentioned that this is ADAR is our, you know, latest feature that we deployed, but it's not like we just deployed it yesterday. We've been working on um, a lot of the use cases that we have in a sandbox. Uh, we call them heavy duty use cases and we get them to a general availability and that's when they graduate into being integrated with the platform so this is fully integrated in, as part of the platform meaning that you know as you're asking questions and answering those questions from the buy side sell side or bi-directional uh, now this is actually built in and it looks at the answers that were provided and it, it's ring fenced on the deal a ring fenced on the room that you're talking about so you can have all that workflow and the permissions and access and and the governance structure in place that governs all of that and ai works within that framework and that's something that does not exist no uh, no competition there's no one out there that's doing what we're doing and that's what i meant earlier about there is a proper way of doing this and you have to think about the build and buy and if you want to do that the reason we did we're doing it this way we started with what we call lightweight uh, AI, which is like deduplication of requests, things like that. And he knows, you know, um, he knows how to uh, figure out like duplicate requests that even if, if the meaning is there, but the words are completely different, it will be able to catch it, things like that. We call those lightweight into uh, AI applications, but for the heavyweights, which we know they have um, uh, implication on the data sensitivity and compliance, we took our time and we work with our customers on graduating them to um, a general availability. So this is the first one that's becoming uh, generally available. And also this is ADAR, but we do also have an assistant at the very top of the, of the menu where you can ask it any question about the deal and it will guide you on where the answers are, where the if questions were already answered. And again, we always leave the final uh, decision making to the user. So AI here, all it can do is support you, recommend, it'll give you the answer, it'll give you a link to where that answer is, and it'll summarize it for you. You can make the changes or you can delete and not accept those changes. So things like that. And we have a lot of other use cases like DCF models and valuations and risk opportunity uh, extraction from contracts and things like that. 
all being developed right now in the sandbox as we go. So um, sorry to interrupt you there, Z, but just wanted no, to. No, no, that. no, no, no. That's that's awesome. Uh, and we, I guess we we just can't say enough about the need for the data security and to understand how you're using the AI, where you're using it, and how it's touching all your systems. And and that's one of the things that comes up is you know, do people understand that, or is it better just to work with people who do? Um, now, you know, let's go on to the next slide and, and, and make sure we have some good time left for questions uh, really quickly. Um, if you remember nothing else, uh, just a few takeaways. It's really important to understand that MNA is transforming not only in what deals get done, but how they're getting done. So what is happening and how it's happening are both changing. Um, AI is clearly going to be a major force that's transforming the entire financial industry. Uh, nothing's going to be left untouched. And then lastly, understanding that build versus buy for the AI capability to, to make sure to empower your, your core business um, and keep pace is going to be a really important discussion. Um, building takes time. It's that simple. Buying takes a lot less. <laughs> so I'll leave it there, um, and we'd love to hear more questions. Yeah, Z, I, I've got a, a couple of questions. So, so how have you seen the financial services market respond to AI in its adoption? Yeah, yeah, no, no, that, that's a really good one. Um, so it's it's been it's been completely varied. It's fractured, right? You have people who who are trying a lot of things. Um, some of them with success, some of them not, and others who are who are really slow and, and are sitting on the fence. Um, it, it's it's very much a mixed bag. Um, Rob, do, uh, other yeah, thoughts? Yeah. No, I mean I, we can talk uh, from personal experience. I mean we're we're talking with some. Um, uh, top investment banks or and mid market uh, investment bank for, as part of um, the community that we're part of here at ACG um, in in San Francisco and the Bay Area, and I, we can tell you mo almost invariably everybody has a a budget that uh, want to look at it internally. We know um, you know which is which is very uh, promising because I can tell you we started this about two and a half years ago, and we anticipated this entire transition right from folks getting from feud to uh you know now they're warming up to ai and acceleration and adoption so second half of 24 we're seeing that acceleration and we're actually having warmer conversation about um you know not just the ai but also the automation of things that we're doing so the, you have to think of both right so ai and not everything is ai um <laughs> and needed is needed, but uh, but automation and AI together, I think we could um, could have a major impact on FSI, and that's what we've seen. Folks now are warming up, they're adopting it, and, and now they're going to come to that conclusion where they're you know do we want to focus on our core business and and have something that supports us, or or do we want to build something or buy something that has the best. Uh, uh, best practices from the industry and from technology so that they can benefit and focus on what they're doing. That's kind of, uh, um, and we just had a, a something called M&A West here in Napa, where uh, we met with uh, 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 a really interesting uh, personality, MC Hammer, uh, who's also a technologist. We had a wonderful conversation with him and he had an AI application on his phone that he was sharing with us and uh, during the M&A West, and, uh, and, and it just goes to show that folks with vision and, and, and um, they're, seeing, they're seeing the impact, and this is even reaching uh, the art industry, right? So, and that's kind of what uh, the conversation that we had with MC Hammer uh, kind of led us. But just kind of a little anecdote here about <laughs> what's happening uh, beyond the FSI market. Well, what... Um... Well, what's the cost of not adopting AI for for M and A practitioners? And I, I suspect it's, you know, being left behind and, and losing out on deals. But are there other considerations in terms of uh, what the actual cost is? I think it's 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 not just right. You miss out on deals, but it's not just missing out on deals. You're missing out on deal success, right? Um, if you think about, you know, go back, I, we don't need to move back to the slide, it'll just take time, but right, we didn't come up with that statistic that 70 to 90% of 
M&A fails to achieve its investment thesis. That's research out of Harvard Business School. Okay, looking across hundreds or thousands of deals and, and, spent, and they spent years looking at that data and, and it's peer reviewed published. This is, this is reality. And there's a reason for that. Um, there are actually many reasons for that, uh, and, but most of them are in this cycle. So, so where AI is gonna come in is you, your, your diligence is better, which makes integration easier. Um, you, you know, you're, you're not going to walk in and, and systems like AI, one of the reasons that they've been so quickly adopted in, in military and security applications is because they are often more objective than the humans. So, so things like confirmation bias, um, uh, different types of, and other biases are, if we train our AIs properly, um, are, are not, are we're, it's going to be able to catch us from making those bad calls. Um, so, so they're not just losing out on deals, but the organizations in general are going to lose out on success. That's a lot of money left on the table. That's, that's interesting, the, the confirmation bias and other biases, because you always hear about AIs and that's one of the drawbacks, but you're right, if you, if you get the model correct, in theory, you should be able to kind of model or train that out of the AI where you can't really do that with humans, right? Because we're all inherently biased uh, and flawed. Yeah. Yeah. And then we can we can go down a rabbit hole. But but there. When people talk about that, that's in typically very narrow, specific applications of AI. It's a little different with these broad, uh, these broad LLMs that we're looking at. And it's also a lot about how you use the AI how you're using the data, how you're asking the question. And that's something that folks who, who are, are immersed in that world, we understand how to make that happen and, and, and create the layer so that the general world can interact with that technology through that layer um, in the best possible way. So I've I've monopolized as usual the conversation. <laughs> let's let's see if there's anyone else who have questions. I saw something in the chat. Um, so. Uh, how is a proprietary m a know-how for each entity such as custom request list integration plans lessons learned get protected in the platform how does the platform learn while maintaining confidentiality of this type of data great great question uh when do you guys want to address that one right so so the way we approach this is by ring fencing the um you know the customer and the customer data and we do it per deal so we have a, a unique framework that um, uh, has that ability to do that, to actually ring fence the information, uh, whether it's in a data in a database or structured or unstructured data. That's what I meant to say. So, and that's that's important uh, uh, to know. And that's not something that is trivial, right? So, there's a lot of folks that are going to be working on this. Um, our platform is uh, supposed to work with different customers, different deals, different parties, third parties included. We look at it from different vantage points and different entry points, whether from intermediary or sell side, buy side, what have you. We have the we have the workflow automation in there. And that's the without diving in too much into the methodology that we have, but what we're proud of is the domain expertise that we built in. And within that, we weaved in uh that using our framework of ring fencing the information into the platform. So that's how we're able to do it with AI without having any cross contamination or bleed in and what have you. Not to mention uh, the sandboxing that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, in, in our process. So as a, you know, we, we started this two and a half years ago. We were ahead of the curve in terms of how we envisioned AI is going to play a role in M&A. And we built it knowing that the workflow is the most important piece that will stitch everything together to give us this capability that you're your question you're you're asking about. Um, the other thing that uh, just want to uh, tie this tie this out, I think, with the the earlier question is there's a couple of things that are really important. And I mentioned them uh, earlier in the conversation is the speed to closing that has direct correlation with the success of the transaction, of closing the success of closing a transaction. 
So the faster uh, the faster the due diligence, the higher likelihood that you close the transaction. That's a known fact within the industry, but also opportunity cost. So when you're head down working on a transaction, you're missing two or three or four that are going on in the, in the market. So by the you know by using our platform that supports you in terms of getting faster, more comprehend, more um, complete into, uh, due diligence in that in that manner, and also kind of giving you a capability of um, a repeatable playbook that you can easily kind of engage with. That's uh, that gets you faster to uh, you know uh, success factors that you have uh, set out for the for the transaction itself. Ravi, there's a, another question before we get that one. I just a follow up to to your answer. Does the data ultimately get purged when the acquisition goes through, or is it kept for a future day, future sale, or could it be kept to check later to see if the acquisition's objectives were met? met? And that, that may be on a case by case basis, but I'd be curious. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic question. Actually, that that this is the power of ha of the knowledge base that we're talking about. Um, yes, you do. It's up to the customer. They can keep the data, and we encourage them. And the reason for that is that a lot of the deals you're not reinventing the wheel every time. You have the you can do benchmarking. You can go back, and look at prior deals of the same type, same size. That and you can see, for example, um, what are the um, the different key activities that took place, or benchmarking, for example, budgets for you know potential integration that could happen post close. So you can have all of that information beforehand and you'll have a uh, you know high level of um of, of uh predictability when it comes to what to anticipate in the integration phase from budget perspective hiring and you can look at everything else including um you know um uh, employee d1 like employee day one like when what are the uh, what can you anticipate on a particular deal type or size you know for in terms of employees in terms of retention, in terms of earnouts uh, that you can put. So you have a lot of benchmarking and, and from past data and AI can help you summarize a lot of that stuff in an, in a we're talking real time. When I say real time, you know, we're talking five seconds or so, but it is real time, uh, you know, just from engineering standpoint, real time is milliseconds for us or, or less, but but we're talking five seconds, right? Like five seconds or so, you'll get yeah, a really nice report on the benchmarking and things like that. But um, there's another question and uh, it says, do you have any real examples that you could talk about and how much does a product cost? And, and before you respond to that one, I you know I know the due diligence process, the sales process is, is typically pretty expensive, right? And it's, X number of basis points on on the on the on the deal, and that can add up to you know tens of millions of dollars. How, how is it priced, and, and do you have any examples that you could probably use or talk about? And some of that may be confidential because they may still be in the in the in the process of of an acquisition or sale. Right, right. Um, um, we can talk about like the the way we we frame the pricing. So it's completely disruptive from what exists today. So if you look at, um, and the reason for that. Um, and I'll get to the competition quickly. Uh, the reason we, it's disruptive because we're cloud native. We don't have something what they call TCO, which is total cost of ownership, um, because uh, we're pay per use, right? So we're you know basically on the cloud. We know the true uh, cost of storage. If you look at the competition, they're still pricing based on a model that used to exist about <laughs> you know like you know. Uh, you know, a copy in a, a page, like, a, you know, a eight cents a page. And they, even till today, they'll, they'll you know, price it by that. They'll say, you know, digitally, if you have one page, it's eight cents or what have you. So it doesn't make any sense to be pricing by storage blocks. We don't do that. We don't price by user, um, uh, uh, you know, account. Uh, we don't price by that at all. What we do package by is a number of acquisitions that you do. So if you're doing, say, uh, a serial acquirer doing 10 plus acquisitions a year, then there's a we call that enterprise package, uh, and we can talk to you about that. Like we we want to see what are your needs. Um, you know, it's a subscription model the way we look at it. And again, it depends on if you're coming in from corp dev private equity or if you're coming in from an investment bank. There's different entry points, and based on that, we can 
discuss the pricing with you and arrange a model that works for you. But the idea is that uh, we have enterprise premium package um, that is less than 10 uh, deals. And we have a standard package that is uh, one deal. And then we also offer a limited number of what we call general um, general vaults. And these are general data rooms that have all the capabilities that we talked about from AI perspective, but they're just much better information exchange compared to say Google Drive or what have you. And we give those, we allow for the, the, the packages, enterprise premium and standard to extend free uh, invitations and sponsorship to the general mode um, uh, vault. And uh, the implication for that is, is uh, giving you the ability to create the network uh, seamlessly and digitize it uh, on our platform. So uh, I, I doesn't look like there are any other questions. Um, in terms of how people can reach out to you if they are interested in a the product, they want to learn a little bit more, what's the best way? Is it, to, uh, there you go, contact information. <laughs> Hello at Positon AI. Nice. Yeah, yeah um, you can, we can reach us. We're also on LinkedIn. So please free, feel free to reach out to us uh, on LinkedIn, uh, send us an invite. Happy to connect with you and happy to discuss this in further detail uh, if you want to reach out. Well, Robbie, this and Z, this is a this is a really great great conversation. It's so neat to see all these different applications of AI. It seems like it's a great space for disruption, and uh, in in a you know acquisitions are, are going to be increasing. But the complexities those of those acquisitions and the the nicheness of those acquisitions also seem to be increasing. And so. Uh, a solution like yours seems like a, a pretty good fit. So uh, I want to thank you for, for being on our Tech Talks, and uh, I really appreciate it. And then I want to appreciate and, and thank everyone that's sitting in. And I know this is a long-form uh, kind of interview, and it's a long time to sit through or, or to watch, but uh, but this is really valuable, so thank you. I appreciate, yeah. appreciate, uh, having, appreciate you having us and appreciate the, the audience. Uh, asking questions and listening to us. And uh, thank you, Larry, appreciate that. All right, take care. Cheers.